And here's some of the data. Uh, one of the first things we did was we took our automobile air filters from different locations and we opened them up and you lay the filter paper inside these air filters on a piece of x-ray film and develop them. On the far left we have an automobile air filter that operated during March, April and May in Seattle, Washington. It, uh, it looks clear. If your eyes are really good you can see one tiny little dot near the center. Uh, we have an automobile air filter from Tokyo. And you can see that each one of these black spots represents a radioactive particle that was trapped on the filter paper and exposed the X-ray film. And also we have uh, Fukushima City, which is uh, about 65 kilometers away from the site. Uh, this uh, automobile air filter is actually hazardous. My university is annoyed with me because we have to contract to have this filter disposed of as radioactive waste. Uh, unfortunately, you can just imagine what this means for people in, in Fukushima City, which is not evacuated. And even for the mechanics that are having these air filters. Um, here's a look at one of the particles. We're using a scanning electron microscope to actually see the particle itself. This is a hot radioactive particle. It's about oh, 10 microns across, meaning it is a respirable sized particle. This is one of the very few particles where we found americium, which is a byproduct of uh, plutonium decay. Uh, quick comparison this is the total radiation in children's shoes from uh, Koniyama which is in Fukushima Prefecture. This city is actually featured in today's Wall Street Journal. You can see that the total radiation levels in the shoes from uh, Fukushima are higher for these children than in the U.S. And here we have the total amount of cesium, radio cesium, which is probably the most problematic isotope people are exposed to there. And you can see that the cesium levels are more than 166 times higher in the shoes from Fukushima. So these are actually shoes worn by children in schools and brought home. Uh, we're finding that the laces and the soles are probably the two key contaminated areas on the shoes. The soles are in contact with soils. It's possible that the laces are actually contaminated from contact with the fingers. Uh, since the accidents about eight months ago, the airborne levels have dropped. Uh, the soil levels still remain high in, in places, but the food chain radiation we're still finding increasing. Uh, this radiation is not uniform. There are hot spots, particularly in Fukushima Prefecture, where we might have zones that are relatively radiation-free now that may experience uh, net increases as some of the radiation from hot spots tends to build up. And for an air filter that was run in Noda City, just north of Tokyo, 150 kilometers from the accident site, uh, an indoor home air filter shows 230 picocuries of radiation. I should just say that uh, the U.S. limits radiation in soils is about five picocuries. Uh, for the United States, in Boston, we had uh, a, a one month period where we saw beta and alpha radiation based on particles increasing. And in Seattle, we actually had a two week period where we had four to five hot particles of radioactive material that was tracked by our quantitative filters in the amount of air that people would breathe in a day. But uh, that radiation seems to decline. Uh, the thing that concerns us the most currently about Japan is that the means of testing radiation is still focusing on total radiation and not focusing on hot particles. And we're still using things like circular evacuation zones. We actually took people from safe areas that were 20 kilometers from the site and move them into much more contaminated, unsafe areas that just happen to be further away. This is just done without regard to what the actual scientific data should be telling us. Uh, season 134 and 137 have become ubiquitous throughout Fukushima and even in Tokyo. And uh, in the U.S. we've seen just a few isolated hotspots where we're detecting season in Japan. Uh, I think what this tells me is that this 12-mile evacuation zone we set up around the reactors has not been adequate to protect the public health. And before we feel too good about it here in the United States, I should remind you that NRC regulations, in the event of a similar accident in the United States, call for a 10-mile evacuation zone. Thank you. We have time for one question for Mark Orkhamtofen. Are there any questions? The question is, is the uh, risk based on a hot particle exposure different from uh, that based on a total body exposure? The way they answer this question is we always say that if you compare light amounts of radiation, is the hot particle different from a total body? Well, are there epidemiological, I mean, I know theoretically there are reasons to be concerned. The question is, is there epidemiological? Yes. Yeah. 
definitely want to go there. The, the important thing in that question is, is the, that little qualification of the same amount of radiation. Because a hot particle has a very long residence time, and because it exposes specific tissues for a, a long period compared to an external or, or a photon dose like gamma radiation, you tend to get a lot of concentrated radiation with a long residence time, and your total radiation exposure tends to be higher. When you measure, when you correct or normalize for that radiation exposure, when you artificially raise your external dose to the same as the hot particle, in fact, you find that the hot particle is a little less dangerous because your body acts as shielding. Your tissues where the hot particle is shield the rest of your body from that radiation. So the epidemiological studies show a slightly reduced dose. But you've added that huge fudge factor where you've, you've assumed that the external or uniform dose was as big. And, and that's really hard to do with a short-term dose compared to the, the years you can have a, a hot particle in your body. So if you use that, that fudge factor, you can convince yourself that it's okay. But in real life, the hot particle tends to create a long-term exposure where total radiation goes up more than you would think just based on the, the, the size of the particle. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Marco Kaltofen, Kiru Takaoka, who is the photographer who donated the film. Also, I'd like to thank SafeCast and the hundreds of other people who used the internet and provided the raw information to the Boston laboratories that Mr. Kaltofen used in his analysis. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the Fairwinds viewers for the donations that you have made to the Fairwinds site during this holiday season. It's your donations that keep the site vibrant and keep us moving forward with our educational efforts. Thank you very much. Five o'clock shadow correspondent and source Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates, and before that, Marco Keltofen, the president of the Boston Chemical Data Corporation. And that concludes today's holiday edition of Five O'Clock Shadow with engineering by Kathy Davis, Reggie Johnson, and Michael G. Haskins. We welcome your comments at theshadow at wbai.org. And for Five O'Clock Shadow, I'm Robert Knight in New York. And there will be more 5 o'clock shadow with Robert Knight tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. You are tuned to listener-supported commercial free community radio WBAI in New York at 99.5 FM and WBAI.org on the web. Coming up at 6 p.m. will be a report of the day's news with the WBAI news team. Please stay tuned. This is your WBAI Community Bulletin Board with announcements of upcoming events. I'm Earth Mom. On Friday, December 30th, the African Burial Ground National Monument will celebrate Kwanzaa with live entertainment, interactive crafts, films, tours, and the history of the burial grounds. It's a family-friendly event that begins at 10.30 a.m. and goes through to 4 p.m. The African Burial Ground National Monument is located at the first floor of the Ted Weiss Federal Building at 290 Broadway in Lower Manhattan. All events are free, however, space is limited and reservations are required. For information and to RSVP, call 212-637-2019 or go to nps.gov slash AFBG. Sunday, January 1st, New Year's Day, the 18th annual Alternative New Year's Day event takes place at the Bowery Poetry Club, beginning at 2 p.m. and going through to midnight. It's a spoken word slash performance extravaganza with 150 performers plus open mic. Admission is free. 
and Bowery Poetry Club is located at 308 Broadway in Manhattan. For more information, go to BoweryPoetry.com or find them on Facebook under Spoken Word or call Bowery Poetry at 212-614-0505. NOMA, N-O-M-A-A, NOMA, the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance is offering a digital artist workshop series in conjunction with Yeshiva University. The workshops are for artists transitioning to digital formats, interested in digital marketing and promotional tools, or in learning how to edit films. The classes are bilingual, English, Spanish, and are open to the public. For questions, assistance, and dates of each series, please contact 212 212- Five six eight four three nine six or email info at n o m a a n y c dot org. That's info at n o m a a n y c dot org. This has been your W B A I Community Bulletin Board. If you have an event you would like announced, please send us an email to c b b at w b a i dot org. All right, thank you very much for that. Chugi Kuji Chagali, a self determination, part of the um, seven principles of the Nguzo Saba, the seven principles of Kwanzaa. This is the second day of Kwanzaa. Kuji Chagali, a self determination. And happy Kwanzaa to one and all. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is listener sponsored, commercial free, community radio WBAI in New York. At 99.5 FM, WBAI.org on the web. My name is Michael G. Haskins, your radio host and guide. Coming up at 6 p.m. will be a report of the day's news with the WBAI news team. But right now, let's get a little head start on the weekend and let you know what's taking place. Some of what's taking place on radio station WBAI. Hurrah for revolution and more cannon shot. A beggar upon horseback lashes a beggar upon foot. Hurrah for revolution and cannon come again. The beggars have changed places, but the lash goes on. As I please. Adult Entertainment. Saturday mornings at 7. Hi, if you like early morning radio and have a shovel, you can dig up Uncle Sidney's Saturday morning with the radio on. Tune your implant to WBAI and get an earful of Uncle Sid's Saturday morning with the radio on, which coincidentally is broadcast on Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings at 5 a.m. Yeah, you heard right. 5 bloody a.m. in the morning. Boys and girls, moms and dads, your Uncle Sidney will rise like the undead on alternate Saturday mornings at 5 bloody a.m. here on WBAI to amaze and mystify all that dare listen. Indeed, you are tuned even now to WBAI. Just about a minute before 6 o'clock, the evening news will be coming up in uh, 60 seconds' time. That's to to give you just a little bit of a jump on the weekend, some of the radio listening over WBAI. And, of course, I played it in its actual reverse because Uncle Sidney comes on at 5 a.m. Immediately following Uncle Sidney is Simon Lokely, as I please. I love the way he says that. Adult! Entertainment. Way to go, Simon. Been on the air for many, many years, providing some extraordinary radio right here on WBAI. And right after that, Any Saturday with David Rothenberg. Commentaries and helping you get to the theater as well, supporting radio station WBAI. So much information. You know, you can find out all about the radio station and what's taking all about the radio station and what's taking all 
about the radio station and 